This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. In the 19th century, people's health improved from a combination of clear water, better hygiene, and sufficient and healthy amounts of food. This was called the first revolution in modern health care. In the 20th century, scientific advances, uh, such as the uh, artificial hip and others, brought a new dimension to medicine and also the professionalization of medicine and the institutionalization in our life happened. And that has been referred to as the second revolution in healthcare. What this second revolution has not delivered is informed doctors and informed patients. Today, I will talk about the third revolution in healthcare, which would change healthcare towards doctors who understand medical evidence that means the results of medical studies, including health statistics, and patients who know what questions to ask and dare to ask questions. This third revolution in healthcare is mainly about clean information, not just clean water. I give you two examples to start with where we are. About 10 million American women have unnecessary pap smears for cervical cancer early detection. Unnecessary because they had already had a complete hysterectomy and have no cervix anymore. <laughs> this is, so an unnecessary pap smear is nothing dangerous to a woman, but it is a waste of doctor's time and people's money. Second example, about one million children in the US get every year unnecessary CT scans. A CT scan is not just a waste of money, I mean an unnecessary CT scan, but also a potential danger to the kid there are an estimated 29,000 cancers coming out every year in the future from the millions of CT scans done in the US. Here we have, as I said, not just a waste of money, but also a potential danger. And Many parents insist on that CT scans just to be sure. And the studies show that a majority of doctors do not know the radiation doses that you get. Just to give a, a vivid example, a CT scan has about the radiation doses of 100 chest x-rays. And depending on the organ and how often it's being done, the radiation doses it can be in the order of 40 millisieverts, which is actually the average doses that Hiroshima survivors got who were one or two miles from ground zero. So this is just an illustration. Now, what can we conclude from that? In an article of The Economist that pointed out that people are basically hopeless when it comes to risk. 
uh, we read that people are stupid, lazy, and basically without brains. So there isn't much to do. If you open the literature in psychology, you may read something very similar. Namely, that people are hopeless when dealing with risk. Here are a few quotes. Stephen Jay Gould, the evolutionary uh, biologist, wrote, our species is uniformly probability blind. Or Dan Ariely, in his bestseller, we are not only irrational, but predictably irrational. We means you. <laughs> or Richard Thaler, the economist, writes, our ability to debias people is quite limited. Debias means to help them to get out of their biases. Or if you open Danny Kahneman's most recent book, Thinking Fast and Slow, you find the same message. What can be done about biases? The short answer is that little can be achieved. By the way, Danny Kahneman, in his book, ignores 20 years of research that has shown the opposite, including my research. It's a good illustration that biases exist. It's called <laughs> confirmation bias. This is not the message you will hear today. Um, I will give you an introduction to our research on how to deal with risk. And I will talk about risk in the uh, meaning a uh, risk that can be well estimated, as opposed to in the first lecture I talked about uncertainty, where we need heuristics to do better with uncertainty. When risks can be well estimated, as is often the case in medicine, where we have large epidemiological studies, the problem is not that the human mind is somehow misriot, but the problem is often in experts. Experts who have never learned how to communicate risks, or don't know the risk themselves, or have conflicting interests, interests that are not the same as yours. So, as we will see in this lecture in healthcare, you have to think yourself, and not just trust your doctor. And what, um, what I'm talking today about is that we used our basic research on how we can help people to understand risks by choosing the right representation of information. And we didn't stop by publishing these papers in uh, yeah, psychological and medical journals, but also went out to actually help doctors to understand the evidence better, and also patience. Here is the key message today. How to improve health literacy? The problem is that most doctors and patients do not understand health statistics. And you will see some examples. The causes are not irrationality. The cause is not in the doctor's mind or in the patient's mind, but the failure of medical schools to teach statistical thinking. Is there anyone here who has been in a medical school? Yes. Have you learned statistical thinking? No. <laughs> That's scary, says the next person. And, but I'm not here to scare you. I'm here in order to show how psychological research can actually be made helpful. And then we need more people who go out and help doctors to understand evidence and also to change the medical schools. So, so the first uh, cause is failure in medical schools to teach statistical thinking. S the second uh, cause is biased reporting. And we will see examples hmm, that the information is twisted and statistics are presented in a way that you understand something different hmm, from you uh, supposed to understand, but something different that fits to some interest. 
And finally, for the patient and the doctor, there's a lack of public education in statistical thinking. What's the solution? Teach risk literacy in medical school. In Berlin, at the Charité, uh, uh, we have now uh, one of the first programs where doctors are taught statistical evidence that is to be able to read a medical article in their own field, which most doctors cannot. Second, implement transparent risk communication. In Germany, we have managed that most pamphlets no longer present misleading statistics. That might be a model for the US. I will show you some examples. And finally, teach health literacy in school. Start with first grade. And don't wait until the young kids get into puberty and are seduced by the mass industry into unhealthy food, into smoking, and other behavior that uh, causes health problems. OK, so what I want to do with you now to introduce you by means of examples and some principles in the way how to uh, actually improve the medical system and the health system. What I'm not talking about is how to pour more money in it, because that's not very helpful, contrary to what you hear. It makes change harder. And also, not how to pour more bureaucracy in the system. <laughs> That's mostly defensive. So let's start with the first item. And I give you a few illustrations for uh, this general claim. Most doctors do not understand health statistics. In my estimate, uh, having studied many, many doctors in, in the US and in Germany, about 70 to 80% of doctors do not understand the evidence in their own field. Ask your doctor. And uh, I will give you a few examples, and also about the sources that's behind of all this, and try to mislead. Let's start with Rudy Giuliani. When he was still running for president, he said, I had prostate cancer five, six years ago. My chances of surviving prostate cancer, and thank God I was cured of it, in the United States, 82%. My chances of surviving prostate cancer in England, only 44% under socialized medicine. That's what we have in Germany and in Europe. Hmm? But it's a bad word here. <laughs> For you, <laughs> good luck with your health. <laughs> now I'll show you how socialized medicine, huh? how, what trick Rudy Giuliani is using. But nevertheless, 82 against 44. That's clear, isn't it? You better live in New York than in York. <laughs> that was great news, but also a great error. In fact, the mortality rates for prostate cancer at the time he was speaking were almost exactly the same. How can it be that survival rates are so different and mortality rates are the same? There's a simple answer, because changes in survival rates, as here, are correlated with changes in mortality rates by 0.0. <laughs> and he's using here a trick. I don't know whether he is misleading himself or only the public. Now, why are survival rates, in the context of screening misleading statistics, there are two reasons. First, it's called lead time bias. Imagine two groups of men. All of them have invasive prostate cancer and all die at age uh, 70. The group in the top panel doesn't participate in screening. That might be the English. They're not pushed as strongly as the American men by their doctors or wives. The group 
A whiz screening could be the American, but it doesn't matter. So the first group, they all die by age 70 from prostate cancer. The top group who doesn't participate in screening, here cancer is detected late, say age 67. They die at age 70. What is the five-year survival rate? Zero. Now, assume the same group of men would go screening, that's the bottom panel, and cancer is detected early, say at age 60. What is their five-year survival rate? 100%. Do you see this? <laughs> These people with the higher survival rates do not live longer. They only live longer with the diagnosis. The second reason for why five-year survival rates are misleading statistics in the context of screening is called overdiagnosis. Again, we have two groups of men. The first one doesn't go screening. And there are 1,000 people with progressive prostate cancer. Five years later, uh, 440 are alive, so the five-year survival rate is 44%. Now, another group is going screening. Screening detects not only progressive prostate cancer, but also non-progressive prostate cancer. That is, prostate cancer that men would never notice during their lifetime. And most of prostate cancers are of this kind. So about among the 80-year-old Americans, an estimated 80% have some form of prostate cancer. Among the 70-year-old, an estimated 60%. Among the 60-year-olds, an estimated 40%. So if you are lucky as a man to get old, then you have to count on getting some kind of prostate cancer. But only 3% of Americans die from it. So if everyone goes, there will be lots of uh, people diagnosed who have a non-progressive form. And in that calculation here, let's assume it's 2,000, and you can see that the denominator and the numerator of the formula includes this 2,000, and then out of the 44%, we get 81%. See this? Without any effect. That's Rudy Giuliani's figures. So now you, what you should have understood is that in the, ca in the context of screening, five years of vital, vital rates are misleading statistics because there is a lead time bias and there's overdiagnosis. One should not use them. And every doctor should immediately notice that this is misleading information. Do American doctors understand this? Do they understand the difference between five-year survival rates and mortality rates? So mortality rates is a real thing you should look at. We did the first study with uh, 412 primary care physicians, a national sample in the US, and gave them the same information once in uh, five-year survival rates so the difference, just as Rudy Giuliani did, and then the same information in mortality rates, where the differences are very, very small. 83% judged mortality benefit as large when five-year survival rates were presented. But when the same information was presented in mortality rates, it was only 28%. When we asked them, which information proves that screening tests save lives? And the first alternative was screen detected cancers have better five year survival rate. 76% of the doctors said, yes, that proves, yeah. which is incorrect. They confuse survival rates with mortality rates. When they were asked uh, about the statement, more cancers are detected in screening populations. Does this prove that it saves lives? Amazingly, almost half said yes. But any screening test that is anything good needs to detect more 
that doesn't mean that any life is being saved. And finally, uh, the statement that mortality rates are lower among screened persons in a randomized trials, which is correct, was uh, agreed upon by 81%. And you can see from the similarity between the 76% and the 81% that they're again confusing, the majority is confusing mortality rates and survival rates. To summarize, this is the first study in the US, and it indicates that about three quarters of doctors do not understand uh, survival rates in the context of screening and fall prey to the same trick as Rudy Giuliani's trick. You can test your own doctor. Are German physicians better? We also did the first study in Germany. And what you see here, the effect is even stronger in Germany, although this was not a, a representative sample, but a convenient sample here, that if the information was provided in survival rates, 79% judged screening as effective, but only 5% when it was in mortality rates. We asked the Germans also uh, whether they know about the lead time bias, but only two out of 65 knew. There was a third one who said he knows, but when we asked him, what is it, that wasn't it. <laughs> Overdiagnosis, not a single one out of 65 doctors understood. So you might conclude that the Americans are still a little bit better than the Germans, but both of them are in a state of mind that should never happen. So let's go one step further. So where does all of this come from? And I'll show you first how uh, medical organizations use the five-year survival uh, rate trick to mislead doctors and patients. Let's start with one of the most prestigious centers, cancer centers in the US, MD Anderson. What you see here is an ad from MD Anderson on prostate cancer, and it features a graph where the survival rates are increasing year after year, and that's compared to the national rates, which are not increasing. But if you read closely, you see that the brown bars are survival rates, but the national bars are not survival rates, but mortality rates. And as I mentioned before, the studies have shown that if you correlate changes in survival rates with changes in mortality rates across all solid tumors, you get 0.0. .0. Hmm? But in the text, this difference is attributed to, I quote, more effective radiation therapy and surgery have contributed to overall increase in longevity. There is no increase in longevity. Hmm? I think it's a pity that such renowned centers are out to misinform the public. Now you know at least the trick that's been done. Hmm? If you ever see survival rates in the context of screening, be aware. Here's another organization that uses the same trick now for getting women into mammography screening. And Susan J. Komen is, I think, the founder of the Pink Ribbon Movement, where, uh, and I read, what's key to surviving breast cancer? You. Mm -hmm. And then get screened now. That's the way you deal with women in this country. You tell them what to do. You don't inform them. And if you uh, read on, it says, let's talk more action. Early detection saves lives. And now the only information is coming. The five-year survival rate for breast cancer when caught early is 98%, when it's not 23%. It's the same trick that Rudy Giuliani used. I think that women deserve honest information about the pros and cons, and not pink ribbons and teddy bears. 
I invite you to look up, since we are here in mammography, uh, the, um, the internet and type in mammography screening. What you will find, and I did this yesterday, <laughs> first three ads by uh, hospitals, American hospitals and organizations, no information about the pros and cons, except in one case, five-year survival rates, lots of beautiful pictures about 3D mammograms, about digital mammograms, but no information about what's the uh, benefits and harms. And so it goes on, even the FDA, who gives clear and good information doesn't provide one thing, that is numbers. So you cannot weigh the benefit against the harms because you're not given any information. The same for the American Cancer Society. The US is the only country I know where, yeah, at least in the Western world, so say, it's, US is one of the few ones I know where uh, information about numbers, so numerical information, is not given to the public. In the UK, it's at least deceiving numbers, just so like here. <laughs> OK. Uh, the only uh, reliable information I found on, my f on the first page on mammography screening, because there are over a million hits in 0.34 seconds. <laughs> That's important. Yeah? was the Wikipedia entry, and that was clear. But I haven't seen of any of the organizations providing clear information. So, uh, yeah, that was the information on that. So let me summarize that. I just gave you a blink uh, of some studies that shows that the majority of doctors do not understand health information in the own uh, <coughs> field, and there is a reason for that. Uh, medical schools don't teach that, and all kind of organizations uh, exploit that in order to mislead the public and the doctors about uh, the effects of screening. The second part I talk about is I give you illustrations about what can we do to make transparent, to make information transparent. And the first tool I present to you is called Fact Box. These Fact Boxes have been developed in the US originally by Lisa Schwartz and Steve Woloshin. And uh, they actually made it into Obama's healthcare law, but there are still no Fact Boxes. It doesn't say who is doing them. The FDA should do it. And where is it published? And there seems to be very little interest in getting transparent information to the public. That's part of the third healthcare revolution that we need. What I'll show you now is uh, how can we communicate the results of randomized studies on the efficacy of prostate cancer uh, early detection to the public. This is called an icon box. It's a special kind of fact box that doesn't use any numbers. So everyone here in Numerate will like that. <laughs> what is this? This is a summary of uh, several hundred thousands of men who have been studied in randomized trials where uh, uh, men have been randomly allocated to a prostate cancer early detection group with PSA tests and to a non-screening group. And what the fact box shows is both the benefits and the harms and how big they are. So on the left side, we have 1,000 men without screening. So the idea is to put this side on side, on the right side, the main with screening, so that one can immediately visually compare. Uh, there are roughly eight people who die from prostate cancer within about 10 years. 
eight people among those who participate in screening and eight who do not participate in screening. So that's, these numbers are all rounded because we can never be sure about the decimal behind that, and that's not the point. Huh? Now, uh, and there are 200 people who die from any cause. These are the red ones on both sides. So if you see this, the, if you sum all the randomized trials, and the reference is given here, then one doesn't find a difference, neither in prostate cancer-specific uh, deaths nor in uh, total death. Total death is very important because uh, the, uh, it doesn't help you if you don't die from prostate cancer but you have a severe operation and you die something as a consequence of the operation. That's why you need both of this. The yellow points represent men who are happily living their lives. And the key difference is the group on the right side the blue ones, and these 200 have only harms from screening. So the larger group are men without prostate cancer who get false uh, alarms and biopsies, and the consequences of biopsies. And the smaller group are men that do have prostate cancer, but a non-progressive one, and then get treatment. And this is a really unlucky group. Uh, who, uh, and about half of them will have uh, incontinence and or impotence as a consequence of the treatment for the rest of their lives. But these men typically believe that their life has been saved because of the surgery or radiation treatment. But they would be in a much better state today if they wouldn't have done the screening. Because non-progressive cancer, by definition, doesn't kill you. Such a fact box is an easy way to represent the results. And if new studies come that change the picture, we can amend that. A fact box can be understood by almost everyone. And also, it would help doctors to understand what is the benefit and the harms of a treatment. And it's not necessarily limited to screening. Uh, these fact boxes exist for medication, for knee operations, and for other things. And typically, what's the easiest way to do is, is to use one of the large Cochrane reviews huh, and then just represent the information in a clear way. Now, I know in this country it's a dangerous thing to uh, talk about the evidence for prostate cancer screening because uh, according to one study, 80% of urologists say that they themselves participate in PSA screening. And probably, I would guess, because they don't know the facts. I'll show you uh, what Richard Ablin, the discoverer of PSA, the prostate-specific antigen, said about prostate cancer screening. And now I think you can understand why he said this. I quote, I never dreamed that my discovery 40 decades ago would lead to such a profit-driven public health disaster. The medical community must confront reality and stop the inappropriate use of PSA screening. And that, what he means here, is for screening, not for diagnostic purposes. So when a man already has been operated, followed up. And doing so would save billions of dollars and rescue millions of men from unnecessary debilitating treatments. And that's also the reason why the US Preventive Services Task Force does not recommend that any man should participate in screening, but many doctors do. And as we will see, uh, for three reasons. First, they may not know the studies. Second, they may have conflicting interests, so the clinic may earn money, not just from the test, but from the surgery, often unnecessary. And third, they may fear that the patient turns into plaintiffs and protect themselves against the patient. 
Now, let's move on. Here is a second tool about how to help doctors and patients understand screening tests. And uh, this is called natural frequencies. Natural frequencies is a tool that uh, we tested first and developed and which comes out from a very simple observation, namely, uh, it's a kind of evolutionary inspiration. In the good old times, people had to make inferences about the world without probabilities and without books. How did they do this? By counting. And uh, what I'll show you now is that in order to judge what a test result means, uh, there is one method that's confusing for most of us. It's called conditional probabilities. And there's a simple method that brings insight that's called natural frequencies. Uh, <clears throat> so let's begin with uh, five-star hotels in Berlin. Some time ago, Berlin had 21 five-star hotels. Has any one of you been in Berlin? Yes, good. In a five-star hotel? No. It's gotten more difficult because at some point, uh, seven of these 21 hotels dropped their stars. Some dropped all of them. Some dropped just one. Why would hotels drop stars and all at the same time? What do you think? It has something to do with our topic. It's not that the service was worse. It's not that the location changed. Not even the prices changed. It's all the same. It has to do with continuing medical education. CME happens in luxury hotels. And doctors are spoiled, some say bribed, into a really good time. In Germany, that became a public issue that one didn't want that doctors are indirectly bribed into. Uh, you need to know that the uh, CME is in the hands of the pharmaceutical industry. So they are doing that. Yeah. And uh, so the, um, the, the industry reacted by putting together a commission to change the rules and uh, said that CME will no longer be done in luxury hotels and with spas and other things that are really not necessary. Upon hearing that, hmm, a number of Berlin five-star hotels dropped their stores. <laughs> The same has happened in the US, not as strong because you don't have this strong movement, but some American hotels dropped the term resort in order to get the doctors back. I have been training, I think I'm the only psychologist who has trained about a thousand doctors in this CMU, in the Continuing Medical Education. And I'll give you now one example. So I was in one of these Berlin hotels which no stars anymore. <laughs> and had a group of 160 gynecologists. So continuing medical education, you may think it's, it lasts typically a day, and there are two talks in the morning and two talks in the afternoon, and then everything is fine. So uh, I taught them how to understand risks and uncertainty. And I started out with an task that every gynecologist should know by heart or at least be able to resolve. I'll do the same thing with you now. The point will be that the representation confuses people, usually without them being aware why. And then I offer them a uh, a different representation that helps them finally to understand. Okay, are you ready? I'll try to, you're a smart audience, but with many IQ points sitting here. Nevertheless, I'll try to confuse you, okay? So just imagine yourself you being a gynecologist. 
one of the day-to-day uh, -day things is mammography screening. So assume that you are part of a screening <coughs> uh, and here is a woman who just tested positive and she wants to know from you, doctor, do I have now breast cancer or tell me how likely is it? 99%, 90, 50? Please tell me so that I know how to sleep this night. Huh? So what would you tell this woman? What's the chance if someone in screening huh, tests positive that she actually has cancer? Everyone should know that. But in case you don't know this, you are not a cause, I give you the numbers. I give you the numbers in the way you learn them in your textbooks, specificities and sensitivities. And I tell the doctors, in case you have some fog in your mind, yeah, that's exactly what I want. And then we will get it away. OK, here are the numbers. And I make them e simple. The probability that women in this group has breast cancer is 1%. The probability that she tests positive if she has breast cancer is 90%. And finally, the probability that she tests positive if she doesn't have breast cancer is 9%. In other words, we have a base rate or prevalence of 1%, a sensitivity, the psychologists say hit rate, of 90%, and a false alarm rate of 9%. What do you tell these women? What's her chance that she has breast cancer given that she tested positive. And it's screening. We know nothing else about this woman. 10%? 10%? Yeah. Anyone else? 1%? One percent. One More? 0.9%. Hmm? 0.9%? 90%? No, no, 0.9%. 0.9%, okay. 0.9 is 1%. Okay. 0.9 of 1%. OK, that's 0.9. OK, I'll show you first what the doctors think. And the doctors have four alternatives, which are spaced as far away as I can. Namely, 1%, as one of you thought, 10%, as you thought, and 81% and 90%. What do you think, what you will see? You'll now see 160 points. Everyone for a doctor. And just look at that, and then you see how medical education fails. You don't even know what's the right answer. Just look at that. So 19% uh, think it's 1%. 21 think it's 10%. And the majority thinks it's 81 or 90%. So it really depends what doctor you get. It's the same test. If women would be aware of this variability of interpretations, they would be rightly scared. Now, what I do with the doctors, I teach them to translate conditional probabilities. The conditional probability are the sensitivities and false positive rates into natural frequencies. Natural frequencies means that you start with a number of people, here women, and without normalizing them, just break them down. I make it easy. Let's just consider 100. So think about 100 women. We expect that one of them has cancer, and she likely tests positive. That's 90%. From the 99 who do not have cancer, we expect another 9 to test positive. So we have 10 to test positive. How many of those actually have cancer? Now you can see it. It's one out of 10. That's she was right. I didn't know that. I didn't know it was called that. <laughs> but that's very good. Yes. Mm -hmm. and this is a simple method that could help these doctors to finally understand. And also, if you look here, then you can see that the majority of these gynecologists will instill unnecessary fear in these poor women. Yeah? Until finally the biopsy tells them, oh, it is OK. Yeah. But we know that women 
that many of those women who had these false alarms yeah, live a life from one mammogram to the next mammogram the rest of their lives. Yeah, is anxiety, <gasps> relief. Anxiety, relief. Yeah. So if I teach the doctors to translate probabilities into natural frequencies and test them at the end of a session that's a 75-minute session on the same problem that I didn't get the answer, then here's the result. Now, almost all of them understand that it's 1 out of 10, or here, 10 out of 100. 87%. If you look up there, there are a few hopeless cases. <laughs> But it's 75 minutes, and they've been taught many other things in addition. Huh? So here is a simple example, besides fact boxes, how we could help to understand doctors, to help doctors to understand yeah, health statistics here. What's the, what does a test result mean? Now, how does this work? And this is not just an experimental result we can actually show how it works. And here you see the two representation natural frequencies. Now I take a 1,000. And conditional probabilities. And the solution for the conditional probabilities is called the Bayes rule. And even if you don't understand these rules, just look at it and you see why you had fog in your mind. The interesting thing is that natural frequencies facilitate the computation. So part of the computation is done from outside. And that's a good example why it is important to understand inside from the outside. So behavior and also judgment is a function of both the mind and the environment. An old wisdom that has been hammered into psychology by everyone who thinks in evolutionary or ecological terms. But it's still not there. Because people attribute all kinds of performances to inner reasons. But we can do so much from the outside. And it's the interaction. So the representation does part of the computation. If you understood that, then you can make predictions. For instance, relative frequencies are the same as these uh, conditional probabilities. They will not facilitate insight, but natural frequencies do. Note that these type of Bayesian problems have been celebrated since the 1970s in psychology as one of the key examples why every one of us is so irrational. And you will find the same examples uh, again in, for instance, in Kahneman's recent book on thinking fast and slow. He does not mention that there is a solution, although he knows of that. And we have shown that you can already, with children, when you present the information in the right way, you can help children to solve these problems that most doctors can't. Here's an example. Of course, you need different types of problems. And this is one of an example here from the Ravenclaw School of Magic. And here are wands and uh, magical hats rather than disease and, and tests. And uh, what you see here is a version of with icons and just a text version. And if we add icons, then the majority of our fourth graders can find the Bayesian answer. And uh, already some of the second graders can do this. And none of them have had any fractions. By the way, also children with numerical disabilities who are diagnosed have no problems working with icons and natural frequencies. Again, the reason of the disease may not just be inside, but in the way we present information. And this, I think, has clear consequences for how to revise school. So uh, the next section is on another form of bias reporting relative risks. Um, here is an example. 
A Lipita is the biggest blockbuster from Pfizer ever. And the ad says, Lipita cuts the risk by nearly half. And then it correctly says, in patients with certain preconditions, because in other normal people there is no evidence that it does anything good, uh, Lipita reduced the risk of stroke by 48%. That's impressive, isn't it? So does, does this mean that out of 100 people in that risk group who take Lipida, 50 less will get stroke? No. If you look up the original uh, study, you find the reduction is from, out of every 100, from 2.8 those who, among those who don't take Lipida to 1.5, roughly a little bit more than one percentage point. That's the same as 50%. So 1.3 percentage points, that's called an absolute risk, or rounded one out of 100. A relative risk is these 50%. Clear? It's no surprise that many ads use a relative risk because it's much more impressive than absolute risks. So at one point in time, I believed that journalists and the, um, and the industry are the sources of disseminating huh, the twisted information. But no, amazingly, uh, I was very surprised to learn that it already starts in the top medical journals. Here is another version of a trick. It's called speaking double tongue. So assume you write an article and you want to impress your readers, and you have a medication, and re re you report the benefits and the harms. Maybe that the, uh, uh, the medication reduces, say, heart attack from 2 to 1 in 100, but increases uh, colon cancer from 1 to 2 in 100. How do you present that? In the abstract, you write, there is a reduction of 50%. And somewhere later in the paper, yeah, there may also small side effects, but they are only in the order of 1%. See that? That's, we call this mismatch framing or speaking double tongue. You represent the benefits and harms in different currencies. So in big numbers, the benefits, and in small numbers, the harms. How often does this happen? A study showed that in uh, three top journals, the British Medical Journal, the Journal of the American Medical Association, and the Lancet, between 2004 and 2006, double-tonguing was used in one out of every three articles that reported benefits and harms. I think the editors of journals should not tolerate hmm, that misleading statistics are already part of the original publication. And no wonder that journalists repeat them. I'll show you another fact box now on breast cancer screening. That's another way to bring uh, yeah, transparency in this field. And this fact box now uses numbers instead of icons. Otherwise, it has the same design. You put the no screening and the screening group next to one another so that one visually can compare that. And then the two questions, what's the benefits and what's the harms? And again, among benefits, there need to be two questions be asked. What's the breast cancer mortality reduction and what's the total cancer mortality reduction? And on breast cancer uh, mortality reduction, uh, it is from five in every thousand to four. Again, this is based on hundreds and hundreds of thousands of women in randomized trials. And so this one in thousand is usually represented as one in thousand is an absolute risk reduction. So how would you present that to impress people? As a 20% risk reduction. Yeah? <laughs> And it's often rounded out to 30%. <laughs> the American cancer brochures, also mammography 
screening brochures, who give numbers round this typically up to 33%. Most important, however, the total cancer mortality is 21 in one group and 21 in another group. Why is this important? Because one cannot always identify the cause of death exactly. And particular when people have multiple cancers, that is very hard. And this is why the total cancer mortality or the total mortality is the more reliable statistic. And also in total mortality, we find no difference between taking part of mammography screening and not taking part. What's the harms? Now, there are two uh, major harms for which we have data. We don't have uh, good data for uh, getting cancer from the x-rays. That exists, but we don't have good estimates, so I left it out. False positives with biopsies, these are women who do not have cancer, but are uh, alarmed, and that happens to many. Estimates are between 50 and 2,000. And unnecessary treatments, that are women with non-progressive forms of cancer, 2 to 10. With a fact box, every doctor, every patient can make up her own decision. And we finally would have informed patients. I'll show you now that we don't have informed patients. So we did the first study what women know or think they know about the benefits of mammography screening and also what men know about the benefits of PSA testing. Remember, the uh, best answer would be one in 1,000. And uh, I, we have tested more than 10,000 people in uh, the UK, in France, in the Netherlands, in Poland, in Germany, in Italy, in Austria, in Spain, and Russia. In which of these countries do you think are people best informed? Who said Russia? <laughs> you, and what's your reason? <laughs> okay, you hit, you hit it the second time. Eh? It is Russia. <laughs> so what you see here is, so consider mammography screening. Uh, the red bars are all those who overestimated the benefits by a factor of 10 hundred more or didn't know. And the yellows are, is that proportion who had a realistic estimate which we counted, which was around 1 in 10,000. And what you see here is an amazing statistic. Consider, take the Germans first. This is ranked according to the proportion of people who understand the PSA screening. But take the German women, uh, the uh, mammography screening, 98% overestimate or don't know. It can't be more. Although on the, the British are uh, leading, I think, the world with 99% among the men. I don't have a study in the US, but I would bet it's not so different. There's systematic brainwashing going on. And it's heavily anchored in emotions and beliefs. And the Russians do best by far, not because they get more information, but probably because they get less misleading information. So, uh, let me sum that up. Doctors and patients should have the right to clear information. And what I'm talking about is a problem where that hits many and where we have a solution. And ethics committees should recognize that misleading the public is a key moral issue. Psychologists study trolley problems. Please study the real world. <laughs> Don't hide in the laboratory. Many years ago, Mike Gasaniga came to Berlin and we had a dinner. 
And he said, Gerd, I've read your book, and you have a problem, which is a real one and a solution. And he told me that he is at the President's Council of Bioethics, and he would want to bring that to the attention. And if I remember correctly, Mike also said that they're discussing all the time about stem cells, about abortion, and other issues where there will be never a resolution. So I said, Mike, I would be overjoyed if you would do that. And he did it. And it seemed to be that nobody had any interest. Then misleading the public is not considered a major issue. And risk savvy citizens is also not considered a major goal. Um, also, some years ago, I gave a talk to the National Cancer Institute on how to help people to understand the benefits and harms of cancer screening. And after my talk, one of the directors took me aside and said, Gerd, this is a great program. I said, I'm happy that you think so. Are you going to implement it? <laughs> he answered, no, of course not. <laughs> it would never pass our board. And then he explained that the board is filled in from Washington. And I would never accept this information that you just saw with fact boxes, yeah, because there might be some questions coming up. Why have we told for so many years yeah, something totally different? And then he said, and elections are coming. So politicians would not like that. Again, this is not politics, and this is also not pol uh, medicine for the patient. It serves other purposes. And I think that fact boxes should maybe be available in every doctor's office, but there aren't. In Germany, uh, I have now the largest uh, uh, health insurance company, and we're going to do these fact boxes so that finally the doctors also understand this. There's another reason why doctors do not understand what's going on, and the, also the, the general public, uh, the Cochrane Library is the uh, most trusted worldwide group of evidence-based uh, medical researchers. The Cochrane Library has 10,000s of articles where you can learn about the uh, scientific knowledge today about, God know, about aspirin, about knee replacement, about almost everything. Uh, it's a non-profit organization, and every citizen in Denmark, in the UK, in Ireland, in Sweden, in Finland, in South America, in New Zealand, in Australia, has free access to it, but not you. Americans don't. It's not the idea of this health system to have informed citizens. It would cost almost nothing. And I should add, the other country who also has no access is Germany. And we also have a very expensive health system. And the more money is going in, the harder <coughs> it is to change it. Uh, in Germany, it would cost a cent, roughly, per person and year to have free access. That amounts to a million which is nothing compared to what's wasted in healthcare. We just wasted hundreds of millions on Tamiflu, which is which, where the information about its efficacy is still being withheld by Roche. But yeah, that's the money where it goes. So if you uh, type in uh, the CochraneLibrary.com, you can access the abstracts, but nothing more. While health uh, agencies in other countries just pay this little money so that patients and doctors have free access to the best information available. And the sad thing is that I know many doctors in private practices who have no access to the Cochrane Library because they would have to pay it themselves, and they don't do that. And I sometimes ask a medical student to get information, because the university hospitals, they have that, 
in order that the doctors learn more. And finally, we need honest health pamphlets. You have seen a few advertisements here that are misleading. And I'll give you one example now about a success story. Uh, in Germany, like in almost other countries, the information about uh, the various cancer screenings were uh, provided with in forms of misleading statistics, such as uh, relative risk reductions without ever mentioning what the absolute risk reduction is or five-year survival statistics. For instance, uh, the uh, best-known uh, German cancer organization, Deutsche Krebshilfe, had in its pamphlets for women, uh, go screening, you reduce the breast cancer mortality by 30%, this is 20% rounded up, and there's a 98% survival rate. Huh? So, great. Huh? I'm working in Germany with many uh, medical organizations, and I spend about two dozen talks every year hmm, to medical organizations, typically the, the opening lecture or the, or the, the, the evening lecture. And uh, I must say that the doctors in general are very, very willing to, to learn because they know that I'm not against them, but I'm helping them. Hmm? And I'll test them usually in these uh, talks and, uh, and you may have 500 doctors or heads of departments, and you give them one of these simple examples that I gave you, you will find 450 out of 500 look down. And I tell them, don't look down, look right and left. The others also don't know it. It's not your problem, and that helps them. And then here's a solution. And But in these occasions, I'll also pointed out that one of the reasons why they are misled is I know that they usually don't read medical journals because it's too difficult, huh? and in English, <laughs> is the pamphlets written by these cancer organizations. And I said in public that the major cancer organization in Germany will lose the trust of the public because they mislead the public. And I had to say this for three years, and then the head of the German cancer care flew from Bonn to Berlin, and uh, she was sitting in my office. So she is the, the press speaker, exactly. And uh, asked me, Professor Gigerenzer, do you have anything against our society? I said, no. On the contrary, I offer you to help you to rewrite your pamphlets so that they're evidence-based and transparent, and that people can actually make up their minds themselves. But if you don't do that, we will see who has more power in this country, the Max Planck Society or your organization. <laughs> and I will go on telling this. And then they had insight, and we helped them. And since about 2010, all misleading statistics have been axed out in the many brochures of this cancer society, and the other organization followed suit. So that's a success. They have not dared yet to show a fact box. That would be too, too obvious. But we are working on that. <laughs> so let me um, come to the last slides. I talked today about only one problem of healthcare. That's innumeracy. That's the point that most doctors do not understand health statistics. There is a larger problem here, which I just mentioned, and I call this the sick problem. S for self-defense, I for innumeracy, and C for conflicts of interest. Self-defense means that many doctors view patients as potential plaintiffs and protect themselves by ordering tests, medication, drugs, surgery, even at the risk of hurting the patient. And that's not the doctor's fault, because the doctor doesn't sue. You sue. And it's particularly uh, frequent in this country because of the specific legal system that you have, huh? where lawyers can offer you a free deal. Let's sue him. If we lose, no cost for you, otherwise we split, or a third and two-thirds, depending on the state. 
what is your estimate? How many doctors in the US uh, do defensive medicine? That is, they prescribe to their patients treatments or uh, medication that they would not prescribe to their own relatives. 99%. 99, huh? So there is one study that has asked uh, more than 800 American doctors, and 93% and said, yes, that's what I do. And this is probably an underestimate, because not everyone admits that, also not before herself, yeah? and you may be actually right. So this is a key problem that everyone needs to aware. You have to think along yourself. You can't just put your doctor in the situation that he or she has to protect herself against you. And the doctors are, they have no choice. Conflicts of interest is the, th the obvious one that many doctors and clinics lose money if they would act in your best interest. So that leads to overtreatment, unnecessary surgery, unnecessary medication, and so on. My final point is again a positive one. Health literacy could save more lives than cancer from cancer than screening and drugs. That sounds like a bold claim. And I'm willing to, to bet with anyone that if we would put the same amount of money into the education of young children in health literacy, and also health heuristics. Then we would save more lives from cancer than if you put the same amount of money in the development of the next drug. Why is this the case? An estimated 50% of all cancers are due to behavior. And here are the key culprits. All these numbers are from the US, and they are with lots of error bars, or with huge error bars. Cigarette smoking, estimated 10 to 30%. And it's not just lung cancer, but also bladder and other cancers, and second-hand cancer. Uh, obesity, physical inactivity, and uh, everything that belongs there are probable candidates for a number of cancers. Here are some of this. Alcohol abuse, particularly men, 10%. Women are more reasonable. So it's only 3%. And uh, the uh, hypothesis is that they cause cancers of the breast, liver, and many others. And also, particularly in the US, there is now an estimated number of 2% of all cancers are due to computer tomography scans, mm -hmm. CT scans. Huh? And this number is probably increasing. So. If we would start teaching in school relevant things like risk, risk literacy in health and also money and how to deal with digital media, then we could actually do something. And that needs to be done before puberty, before children get dependent on the opinion of others yeah, more than ever before and after and are easily manipulated by the industry into unhealthy behavior. That would be the real program against cancer. But we bet almost everything on screening, on screening technology, on drugs, with very limited success. There are a few success stories, but most of the cases and the big cancer are not in the success story. And we could do something about this if we would take seriously the war against cancer. So let me end here. I talked today about the problem most doctors and patients do not understand health statistics. The causes are not that we all are irrational and need to be nudged huh, from, uh, into uh, proper behavior, but the causes are mostly external. Hmm? There's a failure of medical schools to teach young doctors statistical thinking. We are surrounded by a mass of uh, misleading and biased reporting. And you've seen a few examples. And there's a general lack of education of the public. If we want risk savvy citizens, we need to do something for it. And the solutions are also fairly clear. Um, and with that, we could 
achieve the third revolution in healthcare, that means living in a world where information is clean and clear, where patients dare to ask questions and understand the system, and where doctors can do the best for their patients. Thank you for your attention. Could you hold on for the Where you showed the benefit being one out of a thousand, basically, was it, well, how were the populations controlled in that? Is it a randomized trial, or is that yeah. just an observational study? No. Uh, in all the fact boxes I showed you, there are only randomized trials. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Are, are they recent? Uh, the. Uh, they are the dependent, so uh, it's the more recent, the smaller the effect. So the last one is the, that was published is the Canadian trial, which looked for 25 years. Yeah, but that's, that effect. was not randomized. The Canadian no. study, are anyone symptomatic went into the screening population? Uh, I don't think so. So there is, there is, of course, always a problem with randomization in every of these groups, but some are better than the others, yeah? But, but that is a potential problem for those kind of studies, is, is how you select your populations uh, uh, and, and how you mark, mark them and, and when they came up as yeah. well. So it's, uh, it's, it's a little bit hard to do. The other thing is it takes a long time for those, for those mortality studies yeah. to take mm -hmm. place. And if you're trying to, like, say, make an incremental difference in, an, in a screening technology or something like that, those studies are virtually impossible to do. Yeah. So the, the Cochrane Society that has done a, a review last year, and they distinguish between better randomized and, and not so good randomized trials. And they find that the, those studies who report larger effects yeah, are those who are worse randomized, as you may hinting. Yeah? And the better randomized, they find very simple, very, very, very small effects, if any. The point is that screening is not the way that we win the war against cancer. It is, if anything, then it's either finding the miracle drug or treatment, or better, more clearly, it's not screening but prevention. Like totally the agree with you there. Like the 50%. But at the same time, almost no money is given to prevention. True. And that's the real scandal in healthcare, True. which also shows that we are still in the second revolution where healthcare is for doctors, for clinics, for the industry, but not for us. Well, one other point. I've spoken to a lot of uh, mammographers in the Santa Barbara area, at least, yeah. and they're very comfortable with recall and detection rates, which are the unconditional analogs of sensitivity and specificity. They're, 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 they're quite used to dealing with three out of a thousand detection rate and say nine or ten out of a thousand, or nine or ten percent recall rate. I would hope that those radiologists here are better than those we have studied. But I'm not convinced. Um, my own cousin is a radiologist here in California. And the stories she tells me do not indicate they're any better than what you have seen. They're better paid, yes. <laughs> Hi, Gert. Um, it's one critical piece of information is uh, what's the effect of deciding to proceed to treat uh, something given uh, a positive diagnostic indicator? Okay, and yet I th you could inform me better, but it seems to me that you know. So I go in the hospital for whatever reason to have a biopsy or a procedure or something, and. I get an infection, I die. That death is not coded as from the yeah. disease, okay, yeah. or even especially from mm -hmm. acting on the positive indicator. Mm -hmm. Is there uh, any effort to, I mean, it, to recode uh, all the harms uh, that are not presently encoded into the system? Yeah, it's a good point, and that is very important to distinguish. Uh, so death from a specific cancer in the screening, huh? from death from cancer or total 
total mortality in general. For instance, what John is uh, saying is take lung cancer screening, which is not recommended by any reasonable society, except yeah, some who have conflicts of interest. And uh, the studies indicate that immediately after the surgery, huh, a certain percentage of people die from the surgery. And that's not, they are not listed of dying from lung cancer. So that looks like a success story if you only have the numbers for lung cancer deaths. And so it is always very important to look at the total mortality because otherwise the safest way not to die from cancer is to shoot yourself. <laughs> yeah. And quite a number of surgery are not so far away from shooting yourself. They can be quite dangerous. Not as effective, of course. Yeah. Uh, amazing, really eye-opening talk. Um, I had a question about one of your, one of the last slides about behavioral causes of cancer, mm -hmm. um, because I think the statistic was a relative rate of 50% given you have a cancer. But if I was, I was just curious, if I leave and lead an ascetic, puritanical life, what's the absolute effect of getting rid of the cigarette smoking, not eating fatty food? Um, how, how little do you actually depress the absolute amount of cancer by teaching people to, to not do these things? So uh, this is a rough estimate again here. So if it's true, if we were to that exactly 50% of all cancers were due to behavior, meaning, of course, you need a, a, a genetic apparatus, yeah, fine. But if you wouldn't add this behavior, there would be no cancer. That's what it means. So, so you are a person that engages in none of these behaviors. So what's the consequence for you? No. Think about 100 people like you who don't engage in this behavior and maybe uh, 10 uh, half cancer, that would mean uh, uh, the uh, 10 would have cancer who engage in some of these behaviors that would mean that would reduce to five. So even if you are the model person, you still can have cancer. And also, uh, it depends what kind of cancer you have. So prostate cancer is that cancer which only hits a, a small percentage of those who have it. Huh? So it's the, one of the best, if you have cancer, one of the best cancer to have. Huh? On the other side, pancreas cancer, lung cancer is no good news. And the, the, what I wanted to emphasize with that is there is such a potential to do something against cancer. And I've been working in Europe with uh, the Dutch Cancer Society. And we had now about three symposia in order to get uh, a school program running, yeah, which makes young kids strong. And not just in knowledge, but also what to do, and also tell them how they will be misled when they enter puberty. That's the strongest thing. Yeah, because they get a natural enemy, and the enemy is no longer their parents, who wants to <laughs> tell them not to smoke. Yeah. And and we have now spent three years, and there's still no single euro available for, for this kind of program. And millions are poured into developing the next Me Too drug. A Me Too drug is something that already exists, basically. And you, you change a few molecules and, and do that. It's just amazing huh, how, with all this rhetoric, huh, uh, so how little money is invested in making people strong. Hmm. Last question. Um, <clears throat> I wonder what you make of effect size. You know, the, Co the Cochrane uh, Library, mostly meta-analyses with yeah. a reported in effect size. Um, there's no absolute meaning to an effect size. Yeah. You can say this one's better than that one. But let's say you have a treatment where um, the best that a new medication, uh, the best that a medication gets you is an uh, effect size of 0.1. Yeah. Should you recommend the medication? That, um, do you see the... Yeah. Hmm. the you hit an important point, namely that uh, most medication 
the effect size is small. I showed you the example of Lipitor, which is one of the most effective uh, uh, drugs. And uh, you've seen of roughly 100 people who take it, one of them, uh, there's one fewer heart attack after, I think it's five years or so. That's all. Hmm? And there are lots of side effects. The, uh, my idea is not to tell people they should do that, they should not do that, but give them the information in a way that they can understand and encourage them to make their own decision. And the moment you understand the sick problem that most doctors defend yourself against you, are innumerate, don't know the evidence first, and also have conflicting interests of you, then it's very clear that you have to think along. Most people who buy a refrigerator look into consumer reports. Hmm? Why not, if it's something important, what you're doing? And last example, to understand how severe the, uh, the, the, uh, the liability program, uh, problem is in this year. So a young doctor, Dr. Merenstein, uh, advised uh, in his clinic a 51-year-old man in engaging in more safe yeah, lifestyle, including put on your seatbelt, don't be a hero on the road, yeah? and explained him also uh, the pros and cons of prostate cancer early detection, which you have seen in the fact box here, upon which the patient declined to take the PSA test. Hmm? just like the inventor of the PSA said. Yeah? But the patient was unlucky. He got a quick and deadly form of prostate cancer, an uncurable one, and uh, died. So the relatives sued Dr. Merenstein in his clinic. And Merenstein first thought they will sue him because he had not provided the information. Now they sued him because he had provided the information and not done the test. And then you get the typical trial, a jury trial, where the, um, the uh, prosecution brought four local doctors who all testified, we do PSA tests on all men. We don't even tell them. Hmm? And the, uh, the defense had the major scientific proponents of evidence-based medicine, but it didn't help. The jury decision was also typical. Dr. Merenstein was exonerated, but his clinic had to pay a million dollars. First, Merenstein thought he, he will no longer be a doctor. If he can't be a doctor who does the best for the patient, if he can't be an evidence-based doctor in this country, then probably because he had no many alternatives, he's, he stayed a doctor, he's still a doctor. And when I asked him what he's doing, he said, um, I now recommend every man to take PSA tests. My clinic said, we paid once, we will not pay another time. And you need to understand in what situation the doctors are. And this is the sick problem in which they are. And if we want uh, health care reform, we need to deal with these problems and not with the many others that are always talked about.